Rose, would you call roll, please? Chair Longstreet? Here. Vice Chair Clark? Commissioner Cabazos? Here. Commissioner Lesnar Buxton? Here. Commissioner Martinez Cohen? Here. Commissioner Armbruster? Here. Okay, changes to the agenda. We have one change. Chair Longstreet, uh, we would like to take item eight after your consent items. It is an interview and appointment for the Arts and Crafts Show Advisory Committee. Um, Timothy Cardi is here, so we'd like to take it early if that's okay. We will take that early, thank you. Uh, written communications, do we have any? Public comment. Any member of the public may address the commission for up to two minutes on any subject within the jurisdiction of the commission that is not scheduled for a public discussion before the commission. It, seeing no one here for public comment, we've received no slips. Um, we'll move on to the Youth Council report. Nathaniel Gidecho. Okay, close enough. <laughs> uh, it's Gitacho, by the way. Um, Give it to me one time <laughs> loudly so I can hear it. Gitacho. Gitacho. Okay. Yes, Apologize. so, hi, as she said, my name is Nathaniel. Um, so for the Youth Council, we have new members. Uh, two of us are returning, including myself. Uh, we have four more that are reappointed. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we have um, seven new members and four of us are being reappointed, my bad. Um, we still have two alternate positions that are vacant right now. We couldn't get any from any alternate schools. And one thing that the Youth Council would like to do is have it so that we could turn those alternate positions if they're left vacant into at-large positions so we could have more people on the council um so that's something we're gonna keep in the back of our mind um so for this past year we had some ups and downs um we weren't able to complete our project alma we had some uh, difficulties with that but we voted to continue pursuing it in the fall um we'll be working with ymc for that um but one successful project we did have was uh, we worked with COYA and the Tobacco Prevention Program to, um, to conduct surveys about outdoor smoking um, all up and down State Street. I believe it was from Cabrillo to Yonali. We went and surveyed and uh, counted how many people we saw smoking. So that was nice. Uh, we also received a grant from them, so that was very helpful. Um, in the future, we're going to be holding one more meeting we're going to hold one meeting in July and one meeting in August uh, for our new members. And, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's about it. That's all I have for you. Any questions? Thank you. Um, questions? When you guys did your survey on smokers on State Street, did you differentiate between cigarette smokers and people who were vaping? Anything that has smoke coming out of it was counted as smoking. So vaping was included in that. Thank you. Um, do you know what is the process for changing the designation from alternative school representatives to at large? Uh, I believe we would have, we would send the city council a recommendation of some sort and we would, and they would have to push that through. That'd be their decision ultimately. Okay, great. So I think since you have so much turnover year to year, um, it still allows for those positions to be filled by alternative school representatives, um, mm -hmm. but would leave you some leeway to then have a full council. So that, I think that's an interesting proposal. Okay. Other questions? Thank you very much. And, and as you. I always say, we would love to have um, an intern on this commission. Um, we've always enjoyed having that point of view. So if anyone, if you have yeah. any members that are interested, Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, that brings us to Commissioner Committee Assignment Reports. Um, let's start with Ms. Armbruster. I attended the uh, Golf Committee meeting uh, this month, and um, they discussed uh, the summer golf numbers, and um, things are looking 
good right now. Um, and they're just hoping that everybody comes out and sees all the nice work that they've done at the golf course, enjoys it. Great. Um, the, both of my meetings were canceled. Uh, the arts and crafts was rescheduled for yesterday and unfortunately I wasn't able to attend. Um, I did try to attend the one that was then canceled. Um, but then I, and the Creeks commission, Creeks committee, advisory committee, um, was also canceled this month. So I don't have anything. All right. It was close. I attended the Park Foundation board meeting where Netzel Grisby Consultants presented their findings from the Cabrillo Bathhouse and Pavilion Renovation Campaign Feasibility Study. Um, and it was pretty hopeful and I'm excited to see that campaign go forward. And as a parks representative to the, the city's local coastal program subcommittee, I attended a presentation by researcher, researchers from the United States Geological Survey this morning. And they're in partnership with USEC Grant uh, researchers, they presented a coastal storm modeling system that the city will be using to support coastal hazard and sea level rise vulnerability assessments. Um, it was a fascinating two hour presentation about how climate change uh, and sea level rise will affect our community and it was really nice to see the city thinking so far in advance on that. For more information on that, you can go to our coast, our coast, our future.org and see uh, that study online. Thank you. Okay, so I attended the uh, first annual PAL golf tournament, and it was a wonderful event. It was really, really nice, really well done. Didn't come close to winning, uh, but seriously one of the best golf tournaments that I've participated in a long, long time. Uh, even the people that, that I brought agreed, so great job with that. I uh, also attended the Park Foundation uh, meeting. Very exciting to see that we can actually probably achieve that fundraising goal. It's four million dollars. If any of our listeners have that, go ahead and donate it. But I think uh, we we all agree and we saw that it's attainable, and I'm excited to be working on that. And then we also had our first uh, concert, our youth concert series. We're doing three concerts. I have an ad hoc committee that we put together uh, with Rolling Rock Productions, partnership with the Ball and and Parks and Rec. Uh, this was down at Plaza Del Mar on the 17th of June. It was awesome. We had. I want to say six or seven youth bands, one adult band. Uh, it was the, I think it was opening weekend of the Foresters as well, or close to. So we had concerts, the park was utilized. It was great to see the crowd there. And then the people coming to the Foresters game started filling in. It was really, really nice to see. We, w we did it as a soft opening. Our next concert is on the 15th. We're gonna do a little bit more promotion on that one try and partner yeah july 15th and then we have our last one our our closing event will be on uh, august 19th but very very nice to see that park utilized the all three concerts will be taking place in that that venue so come out and see it great music love to have you out there great i attended neighborhood advisory nothing to report this time. Thank you. Um, I attended the Neighborhood Advisory Council too, where we had the infrastructure presentation and the Park Foundation meeting. Um, I also, I, um, it, it had, doesn't really do with Parks and Rec, but I attended this um, Santa Barbara City College Neighborhood uh, Outreach task force and met the new SNAP officers which have been hired by the city to um, do noise enforcement and they're city college students so um, it was interesting to meet them they're great young people and they're having an effect in our neighborhood so that's been good all righty that closes um, our assignment reports and do we have any commission and staff communications okay so we are to ceremonial items employee recognition Zachary. Chair Longstreet and Commissioners, we had two Parks and Recreation employees that were recognized at City Council this month. Steve Biddle, who is a Parks Supervisor in the Parks Division, um, got his five-year pin. So that's his first five years of hopefully many more five years. And Tim Downey, our Urban Forest Superintendent, uh, was recognized for his 10 years of service to the city. Congratulations, Mr. Downey, since you're here. 
<laughs> and I know we have many of the 30-year people when those come around also, so we've been um, pretty fortunate in Parks and Rec with our staff. Um, and our next ceremonial item is the Front Country Trails Program Volunteer Recognition. Ms. Burgess. Hey, hello, Mandy Burgess, City um, or Administrative Analyst for the department, and I have the privilege of honoring two of our um, trail stewards and groups today that really uh, put a lot of time and effort into enhancing our trail system. And I want to, before we recognize them, just give the commission a little bit of background and illustrate some of the tools that these groups use to help communicate with the agencies and coordinate our volunteer. Uh, trail organization uh, or volunteer trail events. What am I doing? Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so when we talk about the front country, we're really talking about the front range of the San Inez Mountains. Um, so what we're looking at when we look from the city up to the mountains, you can see the trail names up ahead on the western side, we've got Arroyo Burro Trail and all the way down on the east, Romero Trail and Romero Road um, up above uh, Montecito. There's 11 trails, uh, designated trails in all, 35 miles, over 35 miles of trail that are really heavily used by visitors and our residents to bike and hike, and, in, and it's a really well-used, enjoyable resource in the area. Uh, jurisdictional oversight is by the City, County, and Forest Service, and a number of years ago, a cost-share agreement was put in place to help financially support the initiatives and actions of uh, the agencies. Um, the Historically and certainly today, um, the primary uh, heavy hand here in ma trail maintenance is through our volunteers and orga organizations like um, those that we'll recognize today. Um, and uh, we're very fortunate to have them as a resource in this area. Uh, in the past, uh, it was the agencies who would be uh, invited to some of the uh, larger trail events, State Trails Day, National Trails Day, and, and National Public Lands Day. A number of years ago, uh, the agencies dedicated the resources and staff and financially to uh, hold those events and city staff on behalf of the agencies really coordinate in conjunction with those volunteers and make those three uh, community events happen. So a number of organizations do work in the, in the area. They all have their niche and their kind of expertise. Those are listed up uh, here. And um, again, it's, uh, we're very fortunate to have such, uh, such a dynamic group that really works countywide and uh, Los, Los Padres Forest Association really working on the back country. Um, so we are here today to recognize the Santa Barbara Mountain Bike Trail Volunteers and Dave Everett of the Multi-Use Trail um, Council. They really have a long-standing relationship with the agencies providing important information on trail conditions and trail use, uh, using technology to communicate um, what's happening out there. They're really the eyes and ears for what's happening on the trails. These groups donate a number of hours uh, monthly and, of course, support us as agencies in the logistics and leadership uh, that we need for our community trail events. And so now I just want to you know, take you through a few photos and illustrate some of the tools that they're using. Dave Everett is notorious for his great photo taking, photo documentation, and his use of GPS. Um, so a lot of the photos you'll see here are by him. And this isn't just in the context of a, a, an event. It's also after a storm event, after wind events. We have down trees, we have trail erosion, we have brush that grows up and over. And they're picking up the phone, they're sending us emails and illustrating the point with you know photos to help. Oftentimes, uh, Dave or Santa Barbara Mountain Bike Trail volunteers will go and take care of the issue you know, notify us that it's taken care of, or sometimes, um, you know, bring us into the fold as well. 
when we are looking at a an event and coordinating event dave has gone to the effort to really uh articulate the needs through his photos and you can see here we're you know working to fill areas, uh, reduce erosion, uh, create trail where a, a slide has eroded the trail. And this, this type of communication really supports us to be efficient. And um, when we have a number of volunteers coming on the day of an event, we're breaking into our groups, we know exactly what the work is and we can kind of get going. Dave also uses his, um, his GPS skills. Uh, this is a, an example from uh, June 3rd, the National Trails Day that we recently held up on the West Fork. Um, and he's just documenting, he's, he's going up the trail and he's documenting where the slides occur, where, the, where we need brush cutting. And again, uh, just, just really helpful documentation that we can look back on you know, for years. Um, down the lower left, you'll see the National Trails Day flyer. Dave is also our go-to uh, for posting all the flyers at the trailhead. So, and we often get uh, volunteers who ha know about the event from posting them at the trailhead, and he also takes them down when we're done. Again, uh, before and afters, this is just showing again the slide uh, that occurred. You can see the trail was really pretty gone, and then the after photo where Re reestablish the trail. Brushwork, you can see the brushwork is really important um, from the photo from the left, pre brushwork to the photo of the right. You can really see how the line of sight really opens up and the trail corridor just kind of widens and really uh, pops. Um, we do have a number of staff, city staff, that are trained in sustainable trail maintenance practices. Uh, one of those, Steve Biddle, um, is, often is a lead, and then we have a number of park maintenance staff that's, uh, that attend the events. They're often using some of the heavier equipment that we wouldn't want to volunteer to use. Um, our forestry crew is there to help us with any of the tree work, the larger limbs, and tree work that we need. And again, it's typically Steve and I that are helping the, uh, to coordinate the three uh, main events, do the outreach, coordinate the resources from our Forest Service and county counterparts, and then working on those logistics with the food and beverage. So. And really, that's it. Um, again, we want to thank Santa Barbara Mountain Bike Trail volunteers. We have Mike Tarpey here on, beha on their behalf. Um, we also wanted to recognize the Jacobson family. They've been uh, part of the Mountain Bike Trail volunteers for a number of years. They're physicians and were on call and couldn't make it at the last minute. Um, and then we have Dev Dave Everett here of the Multi-Use Trail Coalition. So we thank you both. Okay. First, I'd like to present to Dave Everett and someone who I have known and worked on front country trails in a meeting capacity for years and appreciate your dedication and know it firsthand to see you um, moderate. I think that's what I always appreciated was that you represented well and um, when things got hot, you were able to be kind of the cool head in the room oftentimes and um, help get us to a conclusion. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, and do you want to say something now or do you want to wait till after? Till Mike? We get, let's give Mike, Mike, yes. And I know that the, the work that you do, this is Mike Tarpe, um, wouldn't get done if we didn't have the volunteers and we appreciate all of it. Um, thank you very much for everything. And we'll let you say it. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you, uh, commissioners. It's an honor to be here, and I'm just honored to be able to uh, assist in keeping the trails in such great shape. And you know, I want to thank especially City Parks, Jill and Mandy and Steve, who have been really holding things together. If it wasn't for them, this whole program—I hate to say it—would probably be lost. But going strong on eight years, and we're going to keep going. I look forward to a lot more trail work, and uh, I appreciate this honor. Thank you. Thank you. And I think there's somebody else we want to mention, um, our own commissioner, Nicole Clark, um, participates quite 
quite a bit in trail maintenance, and also you've done a lot of trainings, haven't you? And we appreciate it. It's nice to have someone who's dedicated on the commission. Um, I think some of us who've been around a while remember that there were some really contentious times, and so far I appreciate that the city stepped up in a leadership capacity to um, bring all the user groups together and that the county and the Forest Service all participated. Um, sometimes it seems like we never came through to a conclusion, but I do think things are better, and I think that the city continues to keep a leadership role in that, and I thank staff for that. Just, I think Mike Tarpey might want to make a yeah, few remarks, too. Uh, thank you for the recognition. Really appreciate that. And, one of the mirror Dave's comments uh, in terms of Amanda and Steve Biddle's uh, collaboration. It's really a, a collaborative effort uh, in getting everyone together, organizing the troops, so to say, putting boots on the ground and creating a, a what is a fun event too. Um, the last several we've had, you know, 40 plus volunteers show up and just get a tremendous amount of work done and everyone has lunch after and it, uh, it's, it, it truly is a collaborative effort and it's not without people like that. Uh, on staff that, that that can't happen so uh, big hats off to them and as well to Dave um, it's a it's a multi you know uh, different groups coming together to get a lot of work done uh, and I, I'd like to take the opportunity as well just to bring up a, an initiative that uh, Santa Barbara Mountain Bike Trail Volunteers uh, SB Bike and uh, Ealing's Park currently has a, a programmatic approach to introducing more uh, beginner friendly family-friendly uh, mountain bike opportunities to Santa Barbara. Uh, and, and that starts with uh, the introduction of a, a bike skills area or pump track at Ealings Park. We've already picked out a location. I know that City Parks has some influence over what happens uh, at Ealings Park and wanted the opportunity to present that project uh, an opportunity to the commissioners here. Uh, when, when that time is appropriate, uh, I have a, a presentation that I could email out to folks or uh, schedule another time to come back and, and make a presentation, but we'd very much like to present that to you to see the opportunity uh, and, and pursue that, uh, and, and, and I, I would appreciate that. So uh, I'll follow up and, and see what we can do to get that going. Is that the trail building that's happening in Ealings Park? There's no trail building, uh, new trail building currently. No, but there's Park. maintenance. Uh, there, there's maintenance, and that's, that's uh, SBMTV is mostly doing that. Ealings has actually stepped up in, in recent years, particularly this year, uh, in recognizing this, the opportunity um, for trail use at Ealings. And their staff has been doing a lot more of the maintenance along with us. Uh, and so that's been great to see them take some ownership of that. But. Uh, but this would be a, a, a new facility that with the, the focus of uh, increasing uh, opportunities to, to uh, more entry level bike, mountain bike skills. Uh, it'd be a multi-use facility, but, but per, really with the goal of um, increasing that opportunity, we have what are world-class trails uh, as it pertains to hiking and mountain biking in Santa Barbara. But, those are very steep, rugged, rocky mm -hmm. trails. Um, mm -hmm. One of the reasons they take as much maintenance as they do is, is because of the nature. And that has a very high entry level for folks. So families looking to get into mountain biking, there's, there's not a lot of opportunities. Uh, beginners to the sport, not a lot of opportunities. Yeah. And uh, children as well. And so this is an effort to do that. We have a plan. And we'd love to present that to you guys at some okay. point. So. That's great. Uh, my, my ex um, has taken our five-year-old grandson up there to do some, I guess, trail maintenance work at Ealing's. Yes, That's and, what they and, do on and, Thursday and afternoons. He, <laughs> and, and, uh, and Don has been a, a, a big yeah. help over at Ealing's Park as well. So, yeah. um, well, anyway. he's, he's, he's teaching the little, so there you go. Yes. <laughs> the next <good>. generation. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity, and uh, I'll, I'll follow up with, with uh, next steps, perhaps. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Chair Longstreet. I Oh, yeah. Did you want to say? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, my family and I have gone to Lompoc. They have a family-friendly bike park there that does have opportunities. There's little kids on the push bikes learning how to get out there on those trails. And I think having an opportunity like that in Santa Barbara and not having to drive an hour plus to get to it would be really exciting for some families in this community. 
And my last question, my last question or statement was, if, if people watching this love to hike and they love to be on our trails and they want to be a part of the city and Dave's and SPM TV's work, how would they find out about events that are coming up? So SBM TV has a website. You can visit our website as well. We have a, a Facebook group. Um, uh, if, if you're on Facebook, we have a, a mailing list as well. So best way to stay informed is to go to our website, sign up uh, for our email newsletter. Uh, you can be informed that way. Facebook as well. Um, that's Santa Barbara Mountain Bike Trail Volunteers, and um, and then uh, and then Dave as well has has an email list that. Um, uh, that we'd be happy to forward any of those folks over there as well. So, Perfect, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Longstreet and Chair Clark, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Clark, um, they can also contact me uh, through uh, my email address, aburgess at santabarbaraca.gov. When we are holding events um, and a number of these organizations use Meetup as a, uh, a hub, um, uh, Los Padres National Forest Association, Santa, Bar or, um, Santa Barbara Trails Council, and ourselves, we are all using Meetup um, as a, and that's a very easy search, trail events, it will kind of put you in the right direction. Um, and then and we also use our social media uh, prior to trail events that we host as well. But please, um, if you're, if as a first line of defense, you can have folks contact me. Okay. Questions or comments? Chair yes, Longstreet, if I could just poke a few words in, I know we've talked a lot of things. I, I do actually want to personally thank SBM TV, Mike, for being here, and Dave Everett, and the multitude of volunteers. Um, they go out and do stuff without us. I mean, we've talked about the three events that we help coordinate, but there's people out working on the trails on a, on a regular, regular basis. And I don't think the general public and the trail using community has a great understanding of the vast amount of volunteer involvement in keeping those trails in the condition that they're in. We went through many years of trying to come up with a coordinated plan and integration in the three agencies. A variety of reasons has made that um, difficult to move forward with now, but I can vouch for the city of Santa Barbara, certainly, that we haven't lost sight of the future and an ultimate goal that trail maintenance and management is fully embraced by the three agencies. And it's, it's challenging, as you know, when there's competing resources, um, but it's it's still a goal. It's still part of our objective as a department, and we'll keep trying to move forward. In the interim, uh, the department's commitment is to move forward with these three days, and and also have our staff become more involved and integrated, not only for what they can do on the front country, but then translate those skills into our own park open spaces, and that helps build our own internal skill base for maintaining our open spaces. So. I want to give a personal shout out and thank you because really it's it's one of those things that people have to work and outside in sometimes hot conditions and they come out and really really appreciate that thank you thank you good way to start the meeting um, well that brings us to our consent items and first we have the summary of council actions are there any questions or comments on that Okay, and then we have the minutes for May 24th. Um, any changes or... I was not at that meeting. I did watch parts of it. And uh, Good job, everybody. <laughs> okay, is there a motion to um, approve the minutes? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Second. All righty. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And one abstention. I'll abstain. Two. Two, Two abstentions. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so we are now going to move to item eight, interview for the advisory committee. Since we have one applicant, it's not, um, 
It's, it's not going to take a long time here. <laughs> uh, welcome. How are you today? Fine, thank you. And um, you, uh, Mr. Carty, you are interested in serving as the at-large position on the um, Arts and Crafts Advisory Committee. Yes, that's correct. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience with the committee? And I know you um, I've been an alternate um, on, on the board, on the advisory board right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw that this position was open and it was some, of some interest to me. Um, my background covers business administration and the arts back and forth. Um, I've worked as a professional studio artist. I've worked as a professional handcrafter, and I also have a degree in finance administration. So I think as a candidate for this position, I kind of, I kind of fall into both sides of, of how the, the show runs with our art side and our craft side. So I'm able to see both sides of, of what people are coming in with the opinions and ideas. I also having um, my arts background, my fine arts background and my administrative background, um, I think adds a lot of strength to that. Um, I think the advisory board should be just that, an advisory board and should be making wise advised, wisely advised decisions for the city to help them. And that's what the, the advisory board should be about. And I'd like to be part of that. I think there was one interesting part you put in about um, marketing, about everybody sort of be helping out with the marketing on social media. And I thought that was a very interesting idea that people, you know, band together kind of and support that. There's a, there's a little um, us versus them um, at, at the show, artists versus cross people. And I think, I think social, social media has become such a wonderfully strong... Um, applicable market marketing thing for, tool for the city and it's it doesn't cost anything I mean if everybody posted that on Facebook that they were at the show every Sunday all of a sudden the show would change if everyone took their many of our artists and our craft people are professional people that have professional pages they could take all of that and post it on there every Sunday and all of a sudden I think we could start seeing a little bit of a change and a little bit of everybody coming together with the realization that if one person says, one person puts something up, someone else might get some business from it. Right. So. right. No, I thought it was a, a very good idea. I, I thought it was a very positive point of view. So um, other questions for Mr. Cardi? Anybody? No, if it's, it's off topic, but it says you're the current owner of Cardigans? I'm the current owner of Cardigans, what the yarn store Jersey? here in town. <laughs> what happened to Josie? <laughs> Um, Josie's, both of Josie's boys have graduated college and she just decided it was time to, um, as she said, become an adult and be able to go on some vacation time. So, um, yeah, so I, I'm there now. So I'm the, I'm the current owner of Cardigans, our, our only yarn store here in town. Yeah, there's not, yeah. we don't have a lot left in town, so you yeah. have to stay in business. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that we're coming with a lot of the work down on Cabrillo not finished, but at least less invasive, um, that it's coming on a positive time for the Arts and Crafts Show, that hopefully um, it'll be a revitalization and a positive time moving forward. So um, I'm looking forward to it. I know just seeing all the construction equipment moving out of that one area at the bridge right I, now. I think all the show members are looking forward to that, <laughs> yeah. too. And I, and I think they realize it's been very frustrating, but I think they also realize it'll be an improvement for everything down there also. So, uh, that, yes, I think yeah. so, too. Okay, well, thank you very much. You. Um, do we have any other questions, or um, I'd entertain a motion regarding this? Um, I'll move to approve uh, Timothy Cardi as the new advisory arts, Santa Barbara Arts and Crafts Show Advisory Committee member. Okay. I'd like to second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We do it right away. We don't That's wait easy. around for the next meeting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, um, now we will move on to tree items. Mr. Downey. Chair Long Street and Commissioners, our first item is 420 Paseo del Descanso. Uh, it's a Mexican fan palm <clears throat> that is directly adjacent to the driveway. The property owner is interested in widening their driveway. It's currently only nine and a half feet wide. 
it's a little difficult to get in and out of, uh, so they're interested in increasing the width of that driveway. Um, the committee uh, reviewed this item. Um, the tree, uh, the Mexican fan palm is not the currently designated tree. Um, there are two currently designated, the Blackwood Acacia and the uh, Canary Island Pine. Uh, the committee uh, felt that the driveway widening, uh, along with it being not the designated tree, uh, would be appropriate reasons to remove the tree on the condition that the applicant replace uh, with at least one designated street tree. Um, they are planning to install some landscaping, including some fruit trees a little farther back, uh, but the committee uh, felt that a street tree was important at that location. Okay, thank you. Are there questions? We do not have a speaker slip for this item. Um, comments? Motion? Anybody want to make? A I'll okay. make a motion. <laughs> um, okay. Yes, I would like to make a motion to concur with the committee's decision to approve the removal on the condition that the applicant replace the palm with one designated street tree. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Chair Long Street and Commissioners, the next item on the agenda is 427 Verano Drive. Um, the applicant wishes to remove uh, this evergreen ash tree and a coast live oak. Uh, the ash tree is uh, pretty effectively destroying the side of the driveway. Um, it is small for its uh, eventual size and is already in contact with the driveway. Um, the committee uh, determined that uh, that that tree would just simply destroy, completely destroy the entire driveway. The applicant also uh, is concerned about a root intrusion into the sewer by that tree. Um, the committee also looked at the oak tree. The applicant is proposing to remove both trees and replace with a smaller tree in that area. Um, and they felt that the removal of, of the ash tree without removal of the oak tree would present problems for the new tree that they wanted to plant. Um, the committee uh, felt that the, the oak tree uh, has some value uh, to the neighborhood, and once the ash tree is removed, the oak will develop a better canopy. Um, and uh, so the recommendation is to partially approve uh, this application, approve the ash tree for removal, and deny the oak tree. They did comment that uh, it wouldn't necessarily be necessary to plant the replacement tree if the oak were retained. Okay. Uh, I have a question. When I was out there looking at the site, the oak tree, does it, is it going to fill out? It looks like it's pretty deformed being where it's planted. The, uh, the oak tree was pretty inundated with lower plant material before the, they've since removed. Um, so it developed in an unusual way, but once it gains more light access from the ash removal um, and doesn't have that competition from the undergrowth, um, it, it should develop a, a reasonable canopy. Okay, thank you. That answers my question. Any other I questions? I have a question. So the oak tree is the one, the small tree on the left in this photo, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. It's hard to distinguish it as yes. a separate oh, okay. tree. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other, oak tree is right here. Yeah, that one. Okay. That's what I thought. Any other questions or comments? Okay. A motion. Oh, yeah. So I'll uh, move that we concur with the. Uh, street Tree Advisory Committee recommendation of partially approving the setback tree removal of the ash and keeping the uh, coast live oak. Okay. And that includes that they don't have to put a replacement tree in if the oak. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. We have a second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
Okay, that passes unanimously also. Um, and now we are to 5C1, and we do have a speaker for this. Chair Longstreet we'll, we'll and wait Commissioners. Till the present, yeah, after his presentation, we'll have, yeah. Chair Long, Longstreet and Commissioners, at 1627 Calle Canyon, the, uh, the applicant is requesting to remove a coast live oak tree. Um, their driveway and garage is at a lower level than the rema remainder of the yard, and there's a retaining wall separating uh, the driveway from the rest of the yard. The oak tree uh, unfortunately grew in a place very close to the wall, and as it grew, it's beginning to push that wall over. In fact, it looks fairly eminent at this point. Um, the applicant wants to make repairs to the wall, and the uh, oak tree cannot be preserved with the uh, repairs to that wall. Uh, the committee uh, looked at the application. Um, they noted that there's a citrus tree behind the oak that uh, might benefit from the removal of the oak. Um, there is not a proposal to replace the tree, nor did the committee feel that it was important to do so in this case. Their recommendation is to approve the removal. Okay. Questions of staff at this point? Okay. Mr. Kelly, come on up. So uh, I want to thank the uh, Street Tree Advisory Committee for their attention to this. They, were, they and the city staff were really quite helpful. Uh, my wife and I are not happy about having to remove that, that tree. Uh, this house is my, uh, my wife's childhood home, and so she's lived there and lived with that, that tree since it was, unfortunately, considerably smaller than it is now. Mm -hmm. um, we're hoping that the orange tree will uh, prosper and so on once it's out of the shadow. Also, there is a extremely large live oak that's right smack in the center of the property, and it's very, very visible from the street and comes out all the way, pretty much meet, meeting the tree that we have to take out and extends forward beyond the edge of the house so that we feel that even with that tree gone, uh, it will still present a very wooded, uh, appearance to the neighborhood and it's a very nice very tree rich neighborhood and we think that that's very important so I'm available to que for questions if you have any thank you Good. thank you um, no it is a very nice beautiful area and you mm -hmm. have lots of great trees up there I drove by there today um, are there any questions or comments and I would entertain a motion come on guys <laughs> you can do it. I'll, I'll make a motion to um, agree with the Street Tree Advisory Committee's recommendation to um, approve the removal of the Coast Live Oak at 1627 Kai Cannon. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. And I would say, yes, we agree that that is a sad tree to lose and you will miss it, but um, that, sometimes it happens. Okay, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you for coming, Mr. Killer. Okay. Um, we are now to the director's report. Ms. Zachary. Chair Longstreet and commissioners, uh, you got the first part of the June report with your um, volunteer service recognition. That was an item that didn't make it into the report because we had a standalone, but we did have another volunteer day. Uh, on June 3rd at Mission Historical Park. There are a number of residents in the area that came forward to the department and said, hey, wouldn't it be great if we got some volunteers out to do some work? It's overgrown. We'd like to be able to see what's going on. There's lots of other things, obviously, they'd like to do, as many people like to do on our parks. Uh, I said, let's start with a volunteer work day. And so we had 20 park volunteers that came out and helped really work around uh, where the reservoir is. So if you imagine um, between uh, APS and Mission Ridge, that area, um, it's all, all part of the original mission grounds. There's an aqueduct there. It's challenging to maintain because it's historic property, so we have to balance what we do with what we need to avoid doing to protect the resource. So we actually had an archeologist with us that day to help give us guidance as to what was inappropriate. Hopefully there'll be more opportunities to work in Mission Historical Park. There's plenty to do there. We also completed our latest playground replacement project, Shoreline Park, very well-loved park, very well-loved playground. 
Uh, it was 15 years old, so on the longer end of our replacement cycle. Uh, lots of community interest in what we might do and great concern over whether it would change substantially. So we installed a playground that's virtually similar to the one that was there before, added some more pour-in-place rubber to um, improve accessibility so it could come up to today's accessibility standards, and then put in a, a couple of new features. Also did some repairs to the wood bench. I would encourage you, even if you don't go use that playground, the bench is really unique in terms of the way it's designed. We have that stockade wall. It's all original to the park when the park was constructed in 1968. Uh, so we did some improvements there. So luckily back then, wood was, in, was really high quality, so it's enabled to last that long, and we want to keep it there for a long time. Summer, summertime is big for camp registration. Our recreation staff are running around every single day. We have over 40 programs that we offer. Uh, we started registration in mid-March. We did a presentation to you on the new website and our marketing efforts. So far, things are looking pretty good. Registration revenue is up over last year. We do still have spots, and so your director's report indicates where folks can go, and all you really need to do is Google SB Parks and Recreation, and you'll find your way to where you need to go. Um, so I'd encourage folks to come out and... Uh, Summer really just kind of started since school just got out. So there's a couple more months for people to enjoy camps and programs. And then uh, Kirby Pavilion, some of our commissioners attended the Park Foundation meeting that we had last week. Uh, we did complete a feasibility study, uh, hired Netzel Grigsby to do that work. Uh, they, through an evaluation process, interview process with 34 individuals, gauged the feasibility of the four million goal that we put out there um, and came back with positive results uh, in terms of because of the historic value of the building really resonated with interviewees and these are individuals that are influential in the community and understand the importance of uh, fundraising and and the potential for private support for a public project that's unique it's not something we do um, on on a regular basis if at all uh, we wanted to test whether this project, given the value of the building from a historical standpoint and then also its value as a community recreation facility, a coastal access facility, whether there was potential. So again, as I said, positive results. Uh, that doesn't mean it happens overnight. There are aspects of our campaign that will be important for us to communicate to reach folks that may be a little uncertain whether it's a good way to invest in a public facility. We're beginning to work on that. Um, and then City Council went ahead and hired Netzel Grigsby to be the campaign management firm for the, for the campaign, uh, in, in, in part or to a large extent, because the Park Foundation doesn't have dedicated staff to undertake something like this. And the Parks and Recreation Department also doesn't have dedicated uh, foundation staff. That said, the Park Foundation will be very much involved as key volunteers as, um, and staff from a staff point, uh, point of view, the director's time and then some administrative time will be dedicated to the effort. Yesterday we were at council with a preliminary uh, concept related to naming, a key feature in garnering particularly larger um, gifts toward a capital campaign is the ability for the donor to be recognized and be recognized in a prominent way. Uh, the city has naming policies for buildings, parks, and streets. We have to look carefully at what other naming opportunities we would provide in association with a major renovation. And so some of the concepts presented to council yesterday focused on, um, first of all, the importance of the name Cabrillo Pavilion because of its historical significance and the fact that David Gray gifted, built and gifted the city, including the furniture, to the city and stipulated that it should be known as the Cabrillo Pavilion. Um, but with, with, within that historical context, identifying opportunities where significant donors could be acknowledged um, without um, uh, taking away from that value. So either naming exterior locations, naming interior locations, we'll be working on defining that more over the next couple of months. But the response from city council is go ahead, come up with a plan, bring it back to us, and, and you know, keep it within 
uh, reasonable parameters, yet also uh, but also provide um, an incentive uh, for potential donors, because we heard that through the feasibility study that it was important. So we're moving ahead as we get closer to having more to present on the project. I'd be happy to do that. I can say this last week we've been talking about project schedules, and so uh, we're very much hoping we will be through the building plan check process by the end of July, have a building permit in hand, which means we would then go out to bid in August. The bidding effort would continue into about mid-September. Then there's lots of steps to take before we'd be at Council for Contract Award, but we're on schedule. The building will close after December 31st, 2017, and we hope to be breaking ground on January 2nd, 2018 for an 18-month construction period. So the fundraising will have to continue while the work effort moves forward with the construction. And lastly, in your director's report, you'll notice that the city received a $2.5 million settlement from All Americans Pipeline for the Refugio oil spill. Uh, portion of those funds, uh, it's split uh, $1.5 million to Cabrillo Pavilion renovation and uh, um, the balance to the Thousand Steps renovation project. Out of that, the attorney's fees will come, so it's not 100% of 1.5 or a million dollars. It does really help us get toward our fundraising, our project uh, cost, uh, funding need for the pavilion, and then also will hopefully give us adequate funds. Our focus at 1,000 Steps is really to go back and um, redo the lowest section of the steps as a first step because trying to take on the whole project is not financially feasible and may not be technically feasible given the location, and then put a handrail in. So we were at Council on Tuesday with an engineering contract to move that project forward as well. So good news for Parks and Recreation, but uh, there's always more work to be done. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Zachary? Yes. Yeah, I had a question about the renovation and the um, Nedsel Grigsby Associates. Uh, so they were they did a feasibility study and now they're managing the capital campaign. And I saw that there was about two hundred and forty thousand dollars that were paying them to manage that campaign. And I would imagine we also paid them to do the feasibility study. Correct. Okay. Um, I just was curious. It's about six percent of the amount that they'd be raising. Kind of sounds like a broker fee or something. I just am curious how that. Uh, is that what do you have any background on that? Is that a reasonable fee? Um, I guess 240k to get four million is not a bad deal. Um, but I'm just curious. It sounds like a lot of fees. So uh, <clears throat> Chair Longstreet and Commissioner Martinez Cohen, there. My understanding is generally you consider it's about 10 percent of your project cost okay. is fundraising. Um, when we look at the structure that we would need to create to actually have a full-time campaign manager for two years plus support staff, um, we're beyond that amount. That number, okay. Um, what we have with Netzel Grigsby, and, and, and clearly in a nonprofit environment with a development director that has a capital campaign and a very robust board of directors. It's a different scenario. Mm -hmm. The city's not in the business of doing this type of campaign, and it's not something the Park Foundation has engaged in. Mm -hmm. Given the timing mm -hmm. and given the experience of Netzel Grigsby to do this type of work, it made sense to move forward with them as our campaign management um, consultant. Okay. Uh, I would say that as we go into fundraising, the city is um, committed to every dollar that's raised through private uh, gifts will be uh, geared towards construction and construction only. So fundraising and the cost of fundraising is a soft cost. Got it. Just like we have soft costs associated with the building being closed. Mm -hmm. um, those are costs that the city will bear as part of its contribution to the project. And that's included in the 15.7 million. Okay. million. So we're very clear on that, that that okay. soft cost is something that the city needs to absorb. Mm -hmm. I, if you recall back to our budget presentation, 
the department is also making some fairly significant changes yep. in its organization by not filling positions and reducing expenses that are associated with the building, but also have a ripple effect throughout the department in, in, in our effort to reduce the cost of the building closure mm -hmm. and to reduce the capital, the need for a capital offset. Right. So we're really trying to minimize soft cost impacts to the capital um, budget in general, mm -hmm. and then also indicate that any private um, dollar raised will go straight into project the construction. construction. Yeah. That's very helpful. Thank you. One more just follow up question. Um, in their feasibility study, did they mention how long they would expect it could take to raise the four million? Chair Longstreet and Commissioner Martinez Cohen, yes, it's it's basically an eighteen month campaign and okay. that's full tilt. That's right, go third, fourth, fifth gear, uh -huh. move forward quickly. We will have a good sense of how really feasible that is, because it's one thing to do a study and test an amount and mm -hmm. get a sense and part of it. And I would say that the interviews that they did are confidential. So the city does not have the information that their interviewees provided, and that was a key aspect of their study. Mm -hmm. They then gave us a, a, a synopsis and a summary and key points um, that focused on aspects of the campaign, both did people like the project and support it, what concerns they had, whether they were willing to give, whether they thought there was private sources within the community that would be willing to give, how much they would be willing to give, so different giving levels. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they gave them the sense that yes, it's feasible. The initial campaign, the time spent developing the initial campaign will really help us determine whether, you know, going from feasible to actual gets us to where we need to, to be in mm -hmm. terms of that goal. And so the campaign would start now, yeah. right? So that I'm just curious about the timing because yeah. it's a 19-month project, 18-month fundraising campaign, so it's going to come in right it, on time, or it, is there going to be a gap? The, thank you very much. Yes, mm -hmm. I mean, and one, of the, one of the things that we, we acknowledge mm -hmm. is, first of all, the campaign is really housed in the Park Foundation in partnership with Parks and Recreation. Uh -huh. uh, so all the funds will actually go to the Park Foundation and then they would get transferred to the city. Okay. Uh, the campaign uh, uh, majority work effort, 18 months with the idea that you've got a sense of your major gifts within the first six months, six months okay. how close you are. Mm -hmm. And that gifts could take up to five years to come in because pledges could be um, as an example, right. someone may want to give $100,000, but they want to do it over four years because mm -hmm. that's what makes sense for their financial planning. Mm -hmm. And so that's, a, it's a new situation. So clearly we still need to move forward with construction because the building is slated to close. We'll see how, how successful we are and what the length of time, but there will ultimately be a lag time between the giving and the actual reimbursement to the city for the expenditure okay so it would be considered a reimbursement so that because obviously the building would get done but you'd know that you'd get reimbursed over that time correct got it okay mr cavazos yeah, yeah I, just, I would just like to add as a as a park board member and a member of this commission mm -hmm. i was really impressed with their with their presentation you know there, there's a gap we knew, we saw the budget parks and rec doesn't have the money mm -hmm. and I think all of the board members agreed, hey, this is a project that we believe in, we want to do. Mm -hmm. How the heck do we get there? Mm -hmm. And they really did a good job of breaking down how you will get there. You mm -hmm. know, it, it, $4 million, I mean, sounds like a lot, but it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's not as if you can just ask, like, Oprah for $4 million. Well, I guess you could ask her for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Oprah, if you're watching, uh, $4 million. Bucks. But they, they did a really, really good job of, of showing us how we're going to be able to do it as, as a board. You know, we all have jobs and things to do, mm -hmm. and we're committed to going out and trying to get the money. Mm -hmm. But again, is it just going and asking Oprah, or how can you break it down, and how can you get it into smaller chunks in a small window, spread over, you know, as Jill said, 
mm-hmm. five years. And once I saw the presentation, I was I was really impressed. Mm-hmm. Got ready to get my checkbook out, and hopefully mm-hmm. all you will as well. Mm-hmm. But I, I really did think uh, <laughs> mine's did not job. getting us to four million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'll, I'll cut the four. I could cut it, but it's going to bounce. Um, <laughs> no, but they they did a really good job, and I think their services. I think uh, they've done similar projects, similar campaigns. Uh, in other cities, so I think it's it's well worth it to get to that that number. I think we can do it. Okay, um, I think that's a great question about the cost of fundraising. Um, and when you, yeah, I hadn't really thought of it this way, but if you look in our community and we have development directors all over the place of varying qualities and experience for these kinds of things. And that, what um, Mr. Cavasso said is very true. They come with a very um, tried and true method. They have experience. Um, I think it would have been uh, much less secure for the city to hire a single person as a development director rather than a an entity, entity yeah. and um, that ta- usually those kind of development directors that are really successful are, um, they're long time people with the cancer s- sansom. You know, they stay in one place and their connections are important. They don't transfer from entity to entity. So I think we're, we have a limited pool that to, of um, individuals, and it, it's, it's pretty risky to hire that way. So I was um, happy to see that, and I think you're right. I mean, if you look at an employee costing 100000 a year for that level, that adds up fast. <laughs> mm-hmm. So um, I'm excited to see this get off the ground, too, and um, committed to it. So thank you very much. Good presentation. Um, yes, Ms. Clark. I just had a, a quick um, comment on the summer camp registration. I, I like to follow the Parks and Rec site on Facebook, and I was really impressed because I saw I saw them post something about the chess camp that's coming up, and there was some parents who commented, that sounds really neat, and then they looked it up, and they're like, well, that, the hours are too long for me, it's too expensive, and whoever's running that page said, here's my number, call the department, we'll help you find something that fits your kids' needs and the hours and your budget. I think whoever did that, deserves a shout out because they're, they're really listening to the community about camp so whoever that was thank you good good nice to hear all righty so we are now on um, item seven Creeks mm-hmm. division 2017 report I hit it again Sorry about that. So my name's George Johnson. Uh, I work for the Creeks Division and in the Parks and Recreation Department. We're going to talk today about the Creeks Division 2017 report. So here's a uh, view of the cover of the, f- of the physical report. It, it's both in Spanish and in English. And it covers, it mostly focuses on the last five years, the achievements the Creeks Division has done. But it also includes some information going back all the way to 2001 from the beginning. And so first I'll talk about water quality improvement. That's a, a pretty big subject area, area we work a lot on. Obviously, um, we've done, I'm going to try to go over some of the highlights. You can see in that little box there, we've taken almost 70,000, I mean, 100, <laughs> almost 11,000 samples of uh, in our creeks and um, waterways here and so we've done a lot of sampling to try to figure out what the problem is and and how we can fix it Um, right now we're focusing more on doing storm sampling and individual projects rather than broad sampling throughout the city and uh, 
like at the bird refuge, we have a long-term monitoring effort there for the last four years to see what's going on with that um, area. So anyway, that's one big part of what we do. Um, uh, go, I'll go back. We also do water quality enforcement. We have a hotline for if people see spills or anything on the streets, uh, someone discharging something that doesn't look good for the creeks or the storm drains. We go out. We have an officer who goes out and investigates that. If we can find the person, we try to educate them and give them a warning. And then if that doesn't work, we go on to fines from there. But that's been very successful. We've actually seen a reduction in the number of uh, illegal discharges in the city, so that's good. We also do work, uh, have contractors go out and remove tr physical trash that we get a lot of in the creeks. We re remove up to 50 tons a year of that trash out of our creeks. So that's, it's good and bad. It's nice that we're getting it out of the creeks, but it's a high number. And that we really haven't seen much improvement in the last five years, unfortunately. Um, we do some other sampling uh, like neonicotinoid, neonicotinoids, or neonics for short. Uh, we've been focusing on that. It's a pesticide that we're finding in, in our waterways, which is unfortunate. And so we're working with the USGS service and, uh, and UCSB to try to find out where it's coming from and what effect it is having on our local creeks. So that's one kind of focus area we've been doing in our sampling. But, um, uh, that, that's kind of a summary of what we, what we do, water quality improvement. For stormwater infiltration demonstration projects, this is a big program we've been doing for the last five or six years. We've replaced a, a, quite a few asphalt parking lots um, throughout the city with uh, concrete permeable pavers. This is good for water quality. It's good for groundwater. It's, it's nice aesthetically. We've got grants from the State Water Resource Control Board to do this, um, do the replacement projects. We've done them in oh, a number of parks, McKinsey, Stevens Park, Oak Park. Uh, we've done Alice Keck Memorial Gardens. We did some sidewalks, Pla Plaza Veracruz. We did a um, alleyway, and we even did some at the Westside Community Center in McKinsey Park. And most recently, we, we completed one on Quarantina Street. And, that, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later as I focus on a couple of, this, of our highlights. Um, creek restoration, you can see there we've, re we've put in almost 37,000 plants since 2001, so that's a lot of plants and trees. Uh, we're proud of being able to been, been able to do that, put that many plants in. We've, we've Im implemented about six large creek restoration projects throughout the city, some again in Oak Park, some at the city's municipal golf course, uh, on Mission Creek and the concrete channels. We did fish passage. So a number of uh, large restoration projects we've completed. Our most recent is in Barger Canyon. We did that in the summer of uh, 2016, and that was a very successful project. We restored over five acres and 2,000 linear feet of creek. So that was a, some of you may have visited that, but that's a pretty neat site out there. Um, so the other big area that we focus on in the Creeks Division is our community outreach and education. You can see a picture here of some volunteers, and you can see the number there. We've had over 6,000 hours of volunteer labor helping us pick up trash in our creeks, on the beaches, uh, plant um, plants in our restoration projects, and uh, replace and uh, clean our storm drain markers that try to educate people about not dumping into our storm drain system. So they've been very helpful. We also have a lot of other ways we reach out to the community. We go to table at community events such as Earth Day. We uh, have a whole creek week, we call it, where we focus on creek and water pollution and, and have a number of different events that people enjoy during that time. We do youth watershed education where we work with a um, nonprofit in our public schools to um, educate the kids about watersheds. And we've had over 3,000 students participate in that over the last 15 years, so that's been very successful. We have a clean water business program where we certify businesses that use proper methods um, in practices to make sure that water pollution um, from their business doesn't enter the creeks and storm drain system. We have 176 certified businesses we've done over the, over the last 15 years. Then we do typical like media campaigns through TV and radio, what are called PSAs, public service announcements. And I'll highlight our most recent one in a couple of the next slides. And then just internet, social media, we've also entered that area to try to get out the word about what we're doing and what people can do to help improve water quality in, in our creeks and ocean. 
So here's Quarantina Street. That's the paver, permeable paver project I mentioned. This is one of the first, this is the first one done on a public street in the city of Santa Barbara and one of the first in the state actually to, to do a public street. So um, it, it was done as, uh, these are demonstration projects and they're being done to educate uh, the local community, developers, homeowners on different ways that they can uh, resurface their parking areas and driveways on their private property. And uh, they've been successful so far. We're happy with the results of this. It looks good. People like it. And, uh, and so far, so good. So that's one project. Here's our PSA I was talking about. This is Creek Man. He's, this has been fun. He's our kind of mascot um, for our, um, our, our public service announcements, our most re ones, recent ones you may have seen on TV, kind of a superhero figure. This is at Earth Day, getting a photo with some people who <laughs> thought that was pretty fun. And uh, anyway, we had them out there and had them do our, uh, our actual TV ads. And so you might see them on the bus or uh, on TV. And we just think it's a fun way to try to get the message out to the public about water quality and creek restoration. And here's, uh, we are working on uh, some new restoration projects. I listed some of the ones that we've completed, but we're, we're working on this one. Um, it's the Andrea Clark Bird Refuge. Uh, there's water quality issues there. We have low dissolved oxygen. We have odor events sometime. Habitat, there is some good bird habitat there, but we think we can improve that. And uh, we just recently received some concept plans, so we're going to start initiating, reaching out to stakeholders in the community with those plans. And the focus is going to be to try to improve circulation between the ocean and the bird refuge. Um, get a uh, little better public access, uh, as well as uh, Im obviously improve the water quality and try to reduce the odor events through, through those and planting some native vegetation. There is a few areas where it can use that and remove some of the non-natives as well. And another program that we, I didn't mention that, that is a big restoration project we're continually working on is our Rundo removal uh, project. Rundo is an invasive plant in all our creeks and We've removed eight and a half acres of Arundo throughout the, the city, which is a lot, and planted over 700 trees. So that's been successful, and we should complete that this fall, hopefully. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Uh, the other restoration project I'd like to highlight is a Royal Borough Open Space, and that's uh, our newest open space park down at the, on Lower Royal Borough at the end of Allen Road. Uh, that was purchased with the house, help of the Trust from Public Land. And it's in total a 20 acre open space uh, parcel, our park. And we have, have received conceptual design plans for that and reached out to the community, community and everybody's supportive of it so far. So we're moving forward with more detailed plans in that. And we hope to complete that in the summer, next summer of 2018. That includes mostly non-native uh, plant removal, uh, planting, and then we want to try to reduce some of the erosion in the area. There's some very steep banks in that location, so we're going to regrade those slopes and plant them so that uh, we can uh, prevent erosion and, and just in generally improve habitat and aesthetics in that, in that park. And so that kind of concludes a summary of what's in the report. We have both physical and electronic copies. You can get the electronic copies at sbcreeks.com, and it's in English and in Spanish. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to say we are really blessed in this community to have the Measure B funds, to have the Creeks Division, to have the people that are working, have worked, and currently work in the Creeks Division, and um, thank you. I mean, it just, it's... When you see what's going on in our country right now, I, I feel like we're in a little island that we need to protect. So thank you very thank much. You. Um, questions or comments? Mr. Cavazos. Yeah, I'd like to second what BB said. Uh, you guys do a great job, Cameron. Your team is awesome. The, the projects you guys work on are, are great. I was really impressed with your, your, uh, your printout. I wish you guys didn't have to print stuff out, but I was very <laughs> impressed with it. Um, Oh, it is on recycled okay, so it is on recycled <laughs> paper. If it were up to me, everything would be uh, digital. But I, it, tremendous job. I have a couple questions or comments. So the the permeable pavers, I love those projects. I think they look great. Do we have any idea on how much water we were able to recapture doing that? I know we we were blessed to have our 
our drought lifted, but do we know any of that? Because I, I would hate to, to have people stop doing that because I think we need to keep the Chair and commissioners, no. I, I don't actually have any idea of how much water in terms of gallons or acre feet that we captured through those projects and were able to put into the groundwater. But we can, we can try and get that figure for you and bring it back. Yeah, I you. think it would be, I mean, I, for now, let's just tell everybody it's a lot, but I mean, <laughs> it, it's a great idea. They look so good and it's the right way to do things in my opinion, uh, especially when you consider our climate and where we live. Um, Regarding the refuse in, in the creeks, do we have any ideas to why we don't see that going down? Is it uh, a homeless issue? Is it just we're all dumb and, and still littering? I mean, I would think this day and age that we, we recognize we've got to keep those creeks clean. We can't just be dumping car batteries or shopping carts or bags or, or uh, brochures. <laughs> do we know why? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Cavazos, to get back to your last question just about the volume of water, the, all of those projects are designed to be able to um, absorb at least a one-inch rainstorm every 24 hours. And some, some of them have water running onto the, to the pavers, and um, some of them just have the water that falls on, the, on them. So all of, the, all of the paver projects that have just had water just falling on them have absorbed all the water that has fallen on it. There's been no runoff. They haven't they haven't filled up and spilled over. Um, some of the other ones in, during the big storms we had this past February, they filled up those they filled up those basins, and then we had some water that that ran over the top. But uh, really, a significant amount. I mean, the Quarantina Street Paver uh, project, the uh, combined with Plaza Veracruz, and then the sidewalks around. Alice Keck Memorial Gardens, um, they, they receive runoff from about a five acre area. So a significant amount of that runoff from, a, from an entire five acre area was, was captured and then allowed to soak into the ground. Um, with regard to the trash, we, you know, it's, it's sad. I mean, we pick up, like as George said, somewhere around 50 to 55 tons of trash that we take out of the creek. and off of the beaches every year. And over the last few years, we have added more beach cleanups along the shoreline and along the creek mouths. And we, um, we're out there now three days a week removing trash from the beach. And then we have hot spots in the creeks where um, you know, the closer you are uh, to a uh, liquor store, uh, Starbucks, something like that, the more you see that kind of material thrown into the, to the creek. Uh, but uh, encampments are a significant part of that. And so we, uh, when we find an encampment or we're notified of one, we'll go in and we post the encampment and the person or the people who are living there take off and often leave everything behind. So we see less things like refrigerators and couches and things like that that we, that we used to find 10 or 20 years ago in the creeks, and, but we do have tents, blankets, sleeping bags, things like that. So Creek Man has his work cut out for him. That's right. And then the last comment I have is really 36, 900 uh, plants. You couldn't find 100 more to get you over the top. 101 <laughs> more. I, I would have donated 101 plants. But uh, no, really great job. You guys do a great job. Uh, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Great work. We look forward to the new projects. I, I think that the paver projects are amongst the most visible, and I think they, they're such an asset to the trees on Quarantina Street. What you were able to do to capture more space for those trees was really important. So um, that is a beautiful street to drive down now. Thank you very much. All righty. Chair Longstreet and Commissioners, since George is sitting here, I would also like to acknowledge that he is the longest serving Creeks Division employee. 16? Yeah. 16 years this summer. Yeah. 16 years this summer. So George is the master behind the Creek Restoration Projects. He's touched everything. He's also done a tremendous job training new employees. As a supervisor, he oversees some of the staff in the Creeks Division. He brings a wealth of knowledge, and his longevity really brings strength to what we do. So 
I was the lucky one who got to hire him, and I'm really glad that he's still with us. So I wanted to Excellent. take the opportunity to thank him for his work. Thank, thank you. you for 16 years' worth of work. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, I think that concludes our business for this week. Um, everybody have a good 4th of July and a safe one, and we will see you next month. The meeting is adjourned.